Well, I will get things started. Hello, everyone. It is great to be together here. I'm Kathy Hawks, Associate Dean for External Relations and Global Programs. Shortly, I will introduce Vijay De Silva to formally introduce our speaker, Professor Danielle Lee. But first, I wanted to kick off with a big thank you. I wish we were in person together and I could hug each of you. But for now, I'm so glad that we can all be on this Zoom screen together. Your support enables so much at the school and gives the Dean's office such flexibility. And in this environment, it has been invaluable for Dave and for all of us. So thank you so much for help with our students, help with fellowships, our faculty, all of your support has made such a difference this year. Thank you again. A few housekeeping items that you need to know as things uh, will progress today. The chat is enabled, so please uh, use that during the session if you have a question. Uh, we will take questions throughout and have saved plenty of time at the end uh, as well for questions and answers. Professor Lee has generously offered to take them, so if you'd like to raise your hand or uh, enter them into the chat, I can call on each of you. For now, you're all muted, uh, but if you would like to answer a question or ask a question, I can call on you and you are, we're in meeting format, so you're able to unmute yourself. And at the conclusion, we may have an extra few minutes if uh, people can stay on, but we do wanna get things started. And we know that this is the end of the day for people on the East Coast here. So at this point, I will turn things over to Dean Circle Donor and Executive Board Member VJ De Silva to introduce Professor Lee. VJ, over to you. Thanks, thanks, Kathy. Listen, I'm very excited about the session today. Um, as Kathy mentioned, I've been, uh, I'm dating myself, but I'm um, class MBA class of 1992, which will mean next year is gonna be 30 years for me, but I'm also on the executive uh, board and uh, a Dean Circle uh, donor for many years. Um, Professor Lee uh, for this session is gonna be super interesting and it, her research extends beyond labor economics into the economics of innovation. And it crosses into things like how organizations evaluate ideas, projects, and people. And on that last bit, uh, which is gonna be the topic of today's discussion, we're gonna hear about how different kinds of algorithms affect hiring quality and diversity. And this has been a, a, an incredibly hot topic in the last few years, as many of us know. Um, this question of hiring bias, finding new pools of talent, uh, moving from credentials-based hiring into skills-based hiring. You know, it's, it's been something that's been evolving fairly rapidly in the industry. I think what's more is we're currently in a very tight labor market in the US at least. And that's become made it even more important for companies to get it right. So a little bit about Professor Lee. Uh, she is the class of 1922 career development professor and associate professor at the Sloan School. She's also a faculty research fellow at the very highly regarded National Bureau of Economic Research. And her work's been published in a number of academic uh, journals, but also in mainstream press like the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, and The New York Times. Uh, she holds an AB in mathematics and the history of science from Harvard College, and then has a uh, PhD in MIT, uh, in, in economics at MIT. Uh, and then she has previously taught at well, the Harvard Business School and uh, at Kellogg. So there's a ton of accolades that she's had, but I don't want to take up any more of, of the time here. So I'll get out of the way and turn it over to Professor Lee. Thanks again for doing this. Great, thank you so much Vijay for the very kind introduction. Uh, let me share my screen and we can get started. Okay. So uh, can everyone see my screen and hear me? All right, thank you so much um, for inviting me to, uh, to come and share my research with you all. Uh, so as, um, as Kathy mentioned, um, I'm happy to take questions either just through the chat or unmuting yourself, and not just questions, but also your ideas and feedback. Uh, this is a setting in which I'm approaching it from an academic perspective, but many of you have much more practical experience, uh, and I would really value learning from that as well. Okay, so this is um, this is a paper that's called Hiring as Exploration. It's uh, joint with Lindsay Raymond, who is one of our wonderful PhD students, and with uh, my collaborator Peter Bergman, who is at Columbia. Okay, so I think I want to start off with the sense that you know, as all of you know, machine learning is a big deal these days, and so there's lots of companies doing AI for this, AI for that, and there's a lot of excitement about the potential for algorithms to improve human decision making. 
And a lot of that is really empirically well-grounded. So there's a growing amount of research showing that machine learning based algorithms can improve or beat human decision making in a range of settings. So I've done work looking at this in the context of hiring. There's been work showing that algorithmic investors can outperform humans in a lot of cases. Um, algorithms can outperform physicians in a lot of cases. Uh, there's also stuff with credit scoring, judges, so on and so forth. So this project, I'm going to be looking at the role of algorithms in the recruiting process. And I think that this is one of the most important applications of, of machine learning technology. This is an area that matters, obviously, for uh, the productivity of our companies and also for individual access to um, economic opportunity, social opportunity. This is an area where there's a lot of, um, a lot of growth and a lot of change. So from a, from a demand perspective, a lot more companies are incorporating ML in some ways into their recruiting process. And so here's a list of companies that are sort of in the public record as doing that. There's many more. And at the same time, there's also an increasing number of companies that are supplying machine learning based recruiting tools. So that even if you're a small firm, you can work with someone else and bring these tools into your recruiting process. But at the same time, there have been a lot of concerns about algorithmic fairness and algorithmic bias. So different, um, different fields use these terms to mean different things. But broadly speaking, there are concerns, um, documented concerns, in which algorithms direct fewer resources and opportunities to uh, those from traditionally underrepresented backgrounds. Um, Something you might have all heard of is Amazon had a uh, recruiting algorithm that they had to shut down because it was essentially identifying whether people are female through words like whether they were on the women's crew team or whether they went to women's colleges um, and decreasing their scores. And so what I wanna do in this project is I wanna ask, is there a way for us to build algorithms that work? So algorithms that identify high quality applicants, but that are also able to distribute opportunity more broadly. So to kind of give some context on this, I want to talk a little bit about how algorithm, algorithmic design works and how it's been applied in hiring. So most modern um, machine learning algorithms, so hiring machine learning algorithms, rely on something that's called supervised learning. So the way that supervised learning works is that you start with a historical data set. So this is a record of people who have applied to the company in the past, and you have some information about them. So these are called the X variables. So it could be their education, it could be their work history, it could be their demographics. And then you have some outcome variable of interest. So this could be measures of how well they do on the interview if they're interviewed, whether they're hired, for instance, um, whether they score well, or it could be measures of how well they do on the job if they're hired. And essentially what you do is you take this historical training data set and you figure out how the X variables predict the Y variable. And so you build this model and you look to see what are the covariates that best predict success in this historical model. And then you apply that to future job candidates and you select the people with the highest scores. So that's the system that most kind of traditional kind of hiring modern machine learning works on. Now, this is, um, this is a system that works really well if in some sense you think that we've reached like the end of history. So if you imagine that any applicant I might see in the future, I can look at my historical data set, find a set of applicants who are exactly like that person or representative examples of that person, look to see how well they did in the historical training data set, and that's a good prediction for how well this future person is going to do. It also assumes that the environment is stationary, so meaning that the predictions that made sense yesterday are going to still apply today. So the same kinds of um, predictors of success in the past continue to apply in the future. And I think there's a lot of reasons to question whether that's the case in hiring. So as we all know, um, not all groups are well represented in the training data set. So, you know, um, if you think about, I'm an economist, uh, the number of um, women or minorities who were in economics 15 years ago is a lot smaller than it is now. And so the predictions that we made on a data set 15 years ago might not necessarily apply today. And it could also be that just jobs are changing and people are changing. and so. You know, over time, we've seen a rising number of women and minorities in STEM. Or if you just think about the kind of COVID. So if we were trying to predict who would be good at MBA teaching online, that's not necessarily the same as who would be good at MBA teaching uh, in person, for instance. And so the broad, um, the broad point and the broad insight I think this paper brings is that we often, these algorithms, we often treat hiring as if it's a static prediction problem. 
So we imagine the world is how it is, and we're going to predict who's going to be good given that world. But in practice, what's happening is that the world is changing, jobs are changing, and firms are trying to learn about who's, who's the best fit over time. So instead of thinking about hiring as a static prediction problem, it makes more sense to think of hiring as a dynamic learning problem, where we're trying to sort of get information to improve our decisions over time. So the way that we treat prediction problems and the way that we treat learning problems statistically are different. And in particular, when we think about learning problems, we often think about them in the context of what's called a bandit model. You might have heard of this. So a bandit model basically means that you have two choices. As a firm, you could engage in what's called an exploitation strategy. And what that means is I use the information I have right now, this instance, to figure out who I think is going to be good. So I'm going to select the people that I think are best based on what I know today. But you can also use an exploration strategy. So what that means is that I'm going to select people that I know less about, not because I think they're going to be the best today, but because by selecting them, I get to learn more about their quality so that my future decisions are better informed. So these kinds of bandit problems have been sort of widely studied in statistics and in computer science, and it's widely known that sort of the optimal solution is going to require a mix of exploration and exploitation. And the problem with most hiring, um, hiring algorithms based on the supervised learning approach is that they're fundamentally myopic. So they fundamentally only focus on exploitation. You gave me this historical training data set. These are the people who are successful in that data set, and that's what I'm going to look for in the future. And I'm not going to sort of think about maybe I should pick people who might look different so that I can learn. So what we do in this paper is we're going to build a bandit algorithm. So this kind of algorithm is not going to, um, it's going to value exploration. So it doesn't want to do the same thing over and over again. It wants to take a chance to do new things because that's going to allow it to learn. So this is the kind of thing where bandit algorithms are actually used a lot in lots of machine learning um, algorithms. So for instance, um, the algorithms that teach cars how to self-drive are constantly trying to sort of get cars to encounter new situations so it learns how to behave in new situations. But that's not the way that we think about hiring. We treat hiring as a static problem um, when we maybe should treat it as a dynamic problem. So we're going to apply this in the context of uh, hiring for professional services, um, which I'm sure many of you are aware is a, is a setting that's struggled with diversity. Uh, so this is not the firm that we got the data from, but this is the, uh, the summer uh, analyst class of an investment bank. And in some sense, this is kind of a picture of the uh, representation problem that the industry faces. This is, um, this is also a setting in which the initial interview decision, who we decide, you know, when we look through people's CVs, who we decide to bring in for an interview is really important. So we get data from, um, from a large company um, that's given us their administrative data. So it's like a Fortune 100 company. They do a lot of hiring um, for these roles. Uh, and they're overwhelmed with options. And this is true of lots of companies like it. So in our data, there are 200 applicants for every hire that the firm makes. And 95% of those people are rejected prior to being given an interview. So you basically um, you know, have a pile of resumes. You just need to sort of get through this pile and pick the people who are plausibly, plausibly good. So the recruiters are making these decisions with very limited information. So this is, um, you just see the resumes, so you see some demographics and work and education history. A lot of this stuff is passed through a talent management software. So you see it in kind of, um, in very, uh, a very kind of routinized format, and you don't necessarily even see a cover letter. And this is a setting in which people are making a lot of kind of crucial decisions very quickly on relatively little information, and decisions really matter here. So for the firm's productivity, it becomes very easy to pass over someone who might be a great fit for the company, and it matters a lot for access to opportunities. So these are good jobs. So these are this, um, this particular company, these are the kinds of jobs that, you know, MIT students apply to, and they lead to kind of economic and class mobility. And so what we want to do is we want to understand if we sort of build a machine learning algorithm to sort of look at this resume review process, can we improve that process? So let me tell you a little bit about um, the data and sort of the algorithms we build and, and how we sort of use them in the work. So this company gave us information on their applicant pool, uh, on their interview decisions, um, and on their hiring decisions. So we're going to see about 90,000 applicants to this firm between 2016 to 2019. So these are people applying for uh, one of three types of jobs, financial analysts, business analysts, um, and data scientists. 
And so what we do is we take this big bunch of data, we're going to split it into what's called a training data set and what a test data set. And in this training data set, this is our historical data. We're going to use this data to sort of build our models and our predictions. And then we're going to take that data that's built on sort of this historical um, data, these models, and we're going to apply them and look at the applicants that come in through 2018 and 2019 and think about how, um, how our algorithms would treat these applicants versus how uh, the human recruiters, the firm, actually treat these candidates. So we're going to observe, observe a few things. So we're going to know whether someone is actually interviewed. So I'm going to call that variable i, and it's going to be zero if you're not interviewed and one if you're interviewed. And we're going to also observe what I'm going to call a measure of quality. So this is whether someone is hired if they're interviewed. So treat this as a measure of how well someone did on the interview. Did you do well enough that the firm decided to give you an offer? And are you a good fit in the sense that you decide to accept the offer? And so what we're going to do when I talk about quality here, what I'm going to mean is, is this person that we interviewed high quality in the sense that they are going to eventually be hired by the firm? There are lots of different kinds of measures of quality that we could use, like maybe on the job performance. We don't have as much data on that. I can talk about it offline, but think about this as our measure of quality. So that's the thing we care about. We care about whether people, whether we, we don't want to waste interviews and um, interviewing a bunch of people that we're never going to hire. So we think about quality as this, and then we can predict it. So we have information on your demographics, um, on your gender, race, and ethnicity, on your education, your work history, whether a referral, and things about the job characteristics. So this is the kind of stuff we're going to use to build the models. So we're going to, yeah. Can I just interrupt with one question that VJ yeah, added to the chat? So uh, I'll read it out loud. How do you think about the right level of exploration that balances finding new profiles with the cost of hiring errors? Yeah, so I think what um, what the model does, actually, I'll, I'll actually go through some of the equations. Um, I think what you, um, it's, I think ultimately in practice, it becomes a, a question about how much you value the short term versus how much you value the long term. If you're doing a lot of um, a lot of exploration now allows you to sort of gather more new information, but it might also mean that you end up picking people that might not necessarily be that great a fit in the short run. And so I think one of the main barriers to adopting these exploration based algorithms is kind of organizational will, because a lot of the benefits accrue in the future, but you're evaluated in how well your recruits do today. So I think from a practical perspective, it's about it's um, about some of these things. Uh, from a sort of statistical optimality perspective, there's actually a bunch of um, research and statistics and computer science that think about what the optimal balance is for certain kinds of learning under certain assumptions. And so the, the model that we implement is going to sort of adopt one of these kind of optimality properties. And I'll show you how it works. Okay, and maybe you'll get to this as well. Uh, there was another question about, uh, did you use GPA or standardized test scores? And you know, so this is um, a lot of, uh, we'd actually, so this is not college hiring. So we, um, this is people who are, have a little bit of work experience. And so typically that's not um, fully included on their, um, on their resumes. There's also a lot of international applicants. And so it's not, it's not standardized. We use the information that was available in the CV. And for the most part, that wasn't, that wasn't there. Thank you. And there's one last question here before we move on. Um, Karen, Karen Liu, I, I don't know if you want to unmute. I think the end of your question was cut off. I can go with the beginning of it then. Um, so uh, this sample was from active candidates, correct? Um, it, it were passive candidates included in the data as well? No, so these are people who applied. Thank you. All right, so We're let me continue. Here in the chat. Great. Okay, so um, since this is MIT, we are actually going to do a little bit of math um, on the equations. Okay, so um, let me talk about sort of how traditional uh, algorithms work. And so essentially, what happens? Recall H here. H is our variable for whether you're hired if you're given an interview. So that's just a variable. This is the variable we want to predict, and we have a whole bunch of x variables. And so essentially, we create a model of that. Um, there's lots of different ways to model it. I'm happy to talk about it offline, but this is kind of what you hear about sometimes when you say people use like logistic lasso or a neural net or a random forest or an ensemble model. So these are all just different ways to predict it. We use um, sort of a standard way of doing that. And so essentially what happens is that we take the training data set, the historical data set, and we just get a model. And the model gives us a prediction of the average quality, my best guess on average, of how well a person with your education, your experience, uh, your work history, uh, your demographics would do, so these X variables, conditional on this data set, this initial data set, which I'm going to call D naught. 
And so this is essentially just the score. And the way that um, sort of the, the most traditional kind of hiring algorithm works is I give you a historical data set, I make this model, and then I just keep applying this model over and over again, and I never update the data. So that is what static supervised learning is. So another thing you can do is you can do a version of that, but you update it. And so what that means is that in the first period, I form a model from my historical data set, and I say, hey, you know, I think we should interview these three people. Once we interview these three people, we know whether they're going to be um, hired or not. So we take that data set and we put those people back into the training data set so that we can then next period re-estimate it with more and more data. So in this way, the data is updating. I'm learning over time. But the process is still myopic in the sense that at any given point in time, I'm just trying to pick who's good right now. I'm not trying to value the fact that there's extra learning. So that's what I'm going to call the updating um, static learning. So the way to think about these models is essentially as we take the historical data set, we form an estimate of the average quality of a person given what I observe about their characteristics. And I use that estimate of average quality to score them. So what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna do something that's called an upper confidence bound approach. And I'll talk to you about why it's called that. Um, but often this is thought of as the idea of let's be optimistic in the face of uncertainty. And so the way that this, this algorithm works is that we're going to start off with the same predictions as the supervised learning models. So at the, at the very first beginning, I train the model exactly the same way, it has the exact same beliefs about how good anyone is. But the way I'm going to score them is I'm going to score them a bit differently. So the standard supervised learning algorithms, the score is determined entirely by what I think your quality is, given your characteristics. What, um, what this type of um, banded algorithm is going to do is it's going to add a bonus. And the bonus is going to be different depending on what your characteristics is. So this is actually just like the full formula for the bonus. And I include it partially because I think oftentimes um, algorithms have this kind of black box feel in terms of how they work. But oftentimes they're actually, if you sort of like look through the equations, they tell you exactly what they do. So, so the way this works is that any given person has a, var a value of x. So this is like you know um, the fact that I went to Harvard, the fact that I'm in my 30s, the fact that I'm Asian and female, for instance. And this X bar here, this is just a way of denoting the average X in the population. So X minus X bar, what that means is it's going to say that your bonus is going to be larger if you're really different in some way from the average person in the data set so far. So if I'm a theater major and no one else in the data set is a theater major, I'm going to get a high bonus because my value of these covariates is very different from the mean. Now, there's another variable here. This is um, it's a, it's a precision matrix. And the way that the precision matrix works is it basically says, I'm going to give you a higher bonus if you look strange on a dimension in which everyone else looks the same. So if I'm a theater major, and that's a weird major, but everyone else in the data set also has a weird major. So someone's a geology major, and someone's a biotechnology major, and another person is a Chaucer major, then you know, I'm going to get a high bonus, but it's not going to be that high because everyone's really weird. But if I'm a theater major and every last person is a business major, then I'm gonna look really strange on a dimension in which everyone else looks really similar. That's gonna give me an even higher bonus. So that's, the, that's just simply how that bonus works. And the way to think about the intuition of that is that in some sense, we form an estimate of the average quality of someone. So this is just how good I think you are based on the covariance that you gave me. And this bonus thing is essentially a measure of how distinctive my covariates are. Am I just unique looking in the data set? And again, if you think about the solution to optimal learning problems, it's a mixture of exploitation and exploration. So if I wanted to engage only in exploitation, I just want to use the data I have now to make the best predictions right now, then what I want to do is I want to score people based on their average quality. That's exactly what supervised learning does. Now, if I want to be really exploratory, and all I care about is just exploring, then what I want to do is I want to score people based on how distinctive they are, and I just want to maximize that. But we know that the optimal solution to learning problems is a balance between exploitation and exploration. So what this algorithm does is that it combines the two things so that both pieces are going to matter. And the way that it combines it is kind of a statistically nice thing, where in some sense, this average quality is just my, my best guess at the mean of your quality. And this distinctiveness, so for those of you who have a statistics background, this is basically a standard error. So this is just kind of telling you that every time we have a guess of someone, you know, there's like what we think they are, and then there's like some noise around the estimate. 
And so what this is saying is that instead of judging people based on my average guess of what their quality is, I'm going to judge them based on the average plus this, the bit of noise I have. So that's going to lead to the upper confidence bound of my guess about them. So if you imagine that, for instance, um, you're looking at two people, you think on average they're probably the same quality, but one of them comes from a group where there's just fewer of those people, you're just much more uncertain about their quality. Because you're uncertain, it could be that they're really good, or it could be that they're really bad. What this algorithm is going to say is that, you know, when I'm uncertain, let me be optimistic. Let me judge them based on their upper bound. And so that's the way in which we're going to incorporate this idea of exploration. That when I don't know that much about them, let me be optimistic, and that might help me learn in the future. So that's sort of the intuition between how, behind how the algorithm works. Just a really quick clarification question yeah. in the chat, uh, Danielle. It's uh, that this is to predict hiring outcome, not job performance, correct? Yeah. yeah, so this is predicting among the set of people who are interviewed, whether you're going to um, end up being hired. There's a little bit of data that we have on job performance, except for we just don't have it for that many people. It turns out that this is very positively correlated with uh, job performance, but we just didn't have enough data to build the model on job performance. Yeah. Okay, so let me, um, let me start by showing you some of the results on the demographics. Okay, so these are, um, this is a panel A, this is the applicant shares uh, that we have. So this is a data set in which actually the majority of applicants are Asian. So this is East Asian, uh, most South Asian primarily. Um, and then on top of that, about a third of people are like 20, 30% are white, 9% uh, are black and 4% are Hispanic. Panel B here is these are, the, this is the demographic composition of the people who are actually selected to be interviewed by the firm's human recruiters. And so what you can see here roughly is that it has a higher share of white applicants, um, a similar share of Asians, and a lower share of, uh, of um, black applicants primarily. So what I'm gonna show you next is I'm gonna show you the demographic representation of the people who would be selected to be interviewed by the traditional um, machine learning, sort of supervised learning versions of machine learning algorithms. So this is the static version. And essentially what happens is that we stop interviewing black and Hispanic applicants and we interview a lot more white applicants. If we do the version of it where we kind of update the data, uh, we get um, the same pattern, but maybe a little bit less stark. So we see again, this dramatic decrease in the share of uh, black and Hispanic applicants um, and um, an increase in white applicants. So now let me show you the panel D. So this is just the old supervised learning. Panel D, this is what happens when you use an exploration-based algorithm. So you see that there's actually a much higher share of Black and Hispanic applicants who are interviewed. There's a lower share of, um, of Asians who are primarily the majority. Um, but you see sort of more, um, sort of broader representation across all of the groups. This is the same thing um, for gender. And so you sort of see that on average, um, out the applicants, about a third are women and the rest are men. Uh, humans sort of keep that application the same. But here we see that both um, the supervised learning and what's called the upper confidence bound algorithm are going to increase the share of women uh, being selected. How am I doing on time? You are uh, perfect. We're at, at five o'clock. You have at least, uh, we have until 530. And so we've okay. been taking questions along the way. Good on time. Okay, perfect. Great. Um, so the key question, so basically what I've shown you so far is that you know, if you use these different kinds of algorithms, you get different shares of people um, of representation. And, you know, if it's the case that we care about um, sort of giving opportunities to people from demographically underrepresented groups, then you might want to prefer uh, this kind of exploration based algorithm. But obviously, sort of the question that, that people have in their minds, and oftentimes the question that people are afraid to ask is, you know, does this increase in representation come at a cost of quality? You know, can you get sort of more diversity, but does it come at, do you have to sacrifice something for it? And so I want to sort of step back for a moment and sort of kind of talk about kind of like research and how we learn things. The ideal way to sort of study this um, would be to actually run a live experiment. So we could take a company and say, let's look at your hiring decisions or your recruiting decisions. And for one group, let's continue with what you're currently doing with your human recruiters. With another group, um, let's use a traditional machine learning algorithm. And with another group, let's use an exploration-based algorithm. And then we can kind of see who do we pick and how well do they do. Um, let me just bracket this for a moment. I would love to do this. If anyone knows anyone who would like to help me do this, I would be so excited to collaborate. Please get in touch with me. That's, um, that would be awesome. 
Um, but in practice, obviously, you know, that's, um, that's quite hard and it requires a lot of organizational resources. And I think honestly, like a real commitment to kind of wanting to know the answer to this question, because, you know, research that looks at race and gender can be quite sensitive, especially in an employment context. So what we have is we didn't, we didn't implement the experiment. What the company has done is they've given us their data. And so we can only observe what actually happened. And so if it's the case that one of the machine learning algorithms says, hey, you should interview Anne. But Anne was not actually ever interviewed. We see that Anne is an applicant, but she wasn't actually interviewed. We don't actually observe whether she would have been hired had she been interviewed. So we don't see that counterfactual. And that makes this a really challenging research question because how can I say whether or not the machine learning algorithm is better than the human in terms of quality if I don't know for sure whether the candidates that the algorithm selects really would have done well. So that becomes sort of the central um, statistical empirical challenge of the paper. So if we had an experiment, we wouldn't have to be contending with this, but you know, in the, in the real world, we don't always have the experiments we wanna run. So we can kind of think about statistical tools to, um, to try to uh, get around that. So what the paper does is that there's really no perfect solution for this. And so the paper shows three different approaches. They have different assumptions. They arrive at the same answer, which is that it turns out these algorithms do better. I'm gonna show you just um, as a flavor, uh, one of these approaches. So one of these approaches is basically the issue is, you know, that it, the machine learning algorithm says interview Anne. Anne's not actually interviewed. So how am I supposed to know whether Anne's gonna be any good? Uh, so one way to do this is to say, let me use the actual hiring outcomes for similar people who are interviewed. So in this example, let's imagine that Anne is a 24 year old white woman with a computer science degree from the University of Michigan. So to infer whether she would have been hired had she been interviewed, we're gonna look at the outcomes of, I'm gonna call them Anna, a bunch of Annas. And Annas are kind of like other 24 year old white women with CS degrees from Michigan who happen to be interviewed. And because they're interviewed, we observe Anna's hiring outcomes. And we're gonna assume that Anne would have had the same hiring outcome as Anna on average. And that's kind of how we make this inference. And so this, has, um, this approach has kind of a key assumption built into it, which is that the outcomes of the people who are interviewed are a good representation of the outcomes of similar people who were not interviewed. But you can imagine obviously that, you know, people with the same CV can still be different. And maybe it's a possibility. So one possibility is that the recruiter meets both Anne and Anna, realizes that Anna is smarter and more motivated, even though they have the same CV, chooses to interview Anna, in which case Anna is actually better than Anne. We can't really use her as a comparison because in this example, the recruiter has some kind of special insight. Um, and that's something that we're, we're not really able to see. Um, so there's sort of two things. So one is that in this setting, like that's true in life. If you actually get to meet people, you sort of make inferences about their quality. But when it comes to resume screening, it's really a lot of people looking at CVs trying to sort very quickly. So the recruiters in our setting actually don't get to meet these people. They don't get to see much beyond what we see. And so we think that this is actually a little bit less likely in our setting, just because the recruiter doesn't have that much information. Um, but we can also sort of try to test for this explicitly. And so what I'm gonna show you next is, I just wanna give, give you a flavor of how kind of modern applied microeconomics is done to think about the kinds of things we do to um, get uh, to get past uh, sort of data constraints. And so what we do here is um, we try to test for this. So here the, the, the fundamental concern is, you know, a person picks Anna because they're actually better than Anne. Like I, I, there's something kind of unobserved to me, but observed to the recruiter, which is why they interview one person and not the other person. And if that's the case, then I can't say the human, that the machine learning algorithms are gonna be better because I'm not crediting human recruiters with that unobserved insight. So the way we're gonna test this is, um, is it's ca the case that most times, like many companies sometimes will explicitly run A-B experiments to learn things, uh, but there's lots of ways in which companies work that kind of generate random variation inadvertently. And so part of what um, a lot of kind of modern um, applied microeconomists um, do is they try to find these kind of cases in which there's sort of a, a natural experiment that occurs within the firm. We try to learn something from it. So, the way that it works, this works in a lot of settings is that when I apply to a company, to many companies, my resume gets assigned to a screener, um, a person to sort of look over that, um, that re resume. And oftentimes it's essentially assigned randomly. 
So, you know, when you, um, when you go through uh, a pile of applications and you say, you take the first 20, I take the next 20, you take the next 20 after that, essentially those algorithms, those um, applications are being randomly assigned to people. But what happens here is that there's natural human variation in behavior. So some recruiters that in our data are just more lenient. So they're just more likely to grant people interviews because they're nicer. And then there are some people, and you all, we all kind of know the people that we're sort of talking about in the world, where there's some people who are just kind of more strict. Every time you give them an idea, they're just kind of poo-pooing it. And there's some people who are kind of more positive. And so my likelihood of getting an interview actually varies a lot randomly, depending on whether I get assigned to someone who's going to be lenient and so, or someone who's going to be rather strict. So if it's the case, so the, the, the concern we have is that sort of humans are really are, are able to sort of see this kind of special insight so that I'm able to kind of correctly rank people based on how good they are, based on things that might be unobserved to the algorithm. Now, if that's the case, then you think about two people who are similar, one of which is, um, if you think about the people, um, the people who are um, assigned to a lenient screen. So this is a person with kind of like a low bar. If you think about the people who are being um, selected by the person with the low bar, they have a lower bar. And so we might expect those people to be worse on average than the people who are selected by a person who is very strict and has a higher bar. So if humans are kind of like secretly in the background good at ranking people based on whether they're good or not, then the people who are subject to a higher bar who have to be evaluated by a stricter screener, they should be better in some way because they were sort of subject to this kind of higher bar. And what we see here is that there's really no relationship. So what's on the x-axis, this is the leniency of the person. So these are people who, have a, who are very lenient. They let most people in, get interviewed. And these people are very strict. They interview very few people. And on the x-axis here, on the y-axis, sorry, is the actual hiring rate. So this is the quality. So these are people, if they're interviewed, whether they're actually, um, they're actually going to do well. So if it's the case that humans have some kind of special insight that's helping them positively screen, then what this means is that if you're evaluated by a really strict screener, you should actually be pretty good because you have to pass a higher bar. And if you're evaluated by a lenient screener, you might not be as good because the bar wasn't as high. So we would expect to see a negative slope. And really here, you don't see that. And if anything, it's a little bit positive. And so these are some of the ways that we kind of, the things we do to sort of test for whether this idea that like Anna is actually better than Anne. So what this is saying is that there's really no evidence that um, if you took two people with the same CV, the one that the human selects, the one that the human prefers, is actually really better in, in, in any measurable way. So with that in mind, here are the results on quality. And so this is hiring yield. So what this says is that in the data, about 10% of people who are interviewed by the human, by um, actually interviewed in practice, end up being hired. If we look at the sort of this, the most simple version of the supervised learning algorithm, we think it's going to improve the hiring yield from 10% to 25%. If we start looking at some of these dynamic algorithms, so this is if we're updating the data on supervised learning or updating the data using this kind of exploration approach, we see that this kind of goes up to close to 30, 35%. And so what that means in the data is that there are a lot of people, like let's imagine you interview um, Anne and Anna, and she's very successful. There's a whole bunch of people that look like this person who applied, but who aren't actually being interviewed. And so the firm could actually um, either reduce the number of slots and hire the same number of people or expand their hires. It can be more efficient because they're sort of more um, able to identify higher quality people. So to kind of to summarize these main results, uh, what this shows you is that you can kind of think about different kinds of hiring practices, interview practices, and plot them in, in sort of like a, a two-dimensional space. And so on the x-axis here is sort of the share of underrepresented minorities, so like how much kind of equality or representation there is. And on the y-axis here is the hiring rate of the people that you're interviewing. So this is our measure of quality. As you can imagine, the human recruiters are right here. The supervised learning algorithm is about here. So it selects fewer um, minority applicants, but it improves the quality of people who are being selected. Now, if you're an economist or a person in general, it's, when you look at these two points, it's very tempting to draw a line here. This is what economists call Pareto frontier. And what a Pareto frontier is, is essentially saying that this is the best that we can do. If we wanna have more underrepresented minorities, we're gonna have to sacrifice in terms of quality. Um, and if we want to maximize, we can kind of, we're sort of shifting through here. So if you look at just these two dots, the way you might interpret it is you might say, look, 
um, what's happening is that algorithms are maximizing efficiency, but at the cost of quality. So what humans are doing is they're, they're on purpose trading off quality in order to get more diversity. So we're engaging in affirmative action that allows us to sort of, um, uh, but at the cost of decreasing quality. But then we have this algorithm, which is the UCD. And once you see that this is here, you can get higher quality and increased uh, minority share. So it's not the case that there's a sort of trade-off at the perfect point that algorithms and humans are making. It looks instead that both of them are kind of what's called inside the frontier, meaning that we can improve on both dimensions so that there isn't necessarily um, the sacrifice. So let me kind of give you the intuition behind that. I think people often think that there's a trade-off between equity and efficiency. That's, that's very much part of the way that we talk about diversity. And, and this trade-off like comes from a very real kind of um, intuitive point. So what many people, when people talk about this trade-off, implicitly what they're imagining is, let's imagine I'm trying to hire for a group and I know who the top 10 candidates are. So I have a list of them in my mind and these are the top 10 candidates. If I want to have more diversity than what's already in this top 10, then I'm gonna have to swap out one of these higher quality people to put in a lower quality person who increases my diversity. And that's the way, and, and that's sort of a mathematical fact. But the reason why that that's not true to real life is that in practice, people can't rank the top 10 candidates perfectly. You don't actually know who's truly, truly the top 10. And because, and there's lots of research showing that just we're bad at evaluating people, we're bad at evaluating ideas, there's tons of biases out there. Now, once you're willing to believe that you don't actually know exactly who those top people are, then there's a lot more space for algorithms or advice or any other kind of tool to improve uh, your decision making on both the quality and the diversity. Once you're not convinced that you're, make, you're already perfect at ranking, there's a lot more scope for improvement. And so what this paper is showing is that um, this algorithmic design can, um, can kind of help human decision makers do that, but that it's not for free. So it's not that you implement any algorithm, you're going to sort of get these, these improvements on both dimensions that in fact, the design of algorithms actually really impacts access to opportunity. And in particular, what we show here is that exploration-based algorithms are able to increase quality and diversity, but the traditional approaches uh, don't. Um, and one thing I sort of want to flag is that this is, this is there's sort of two caveats to this research. One is that, you know, we're not running a live experiment, so you have to rely on some of my statistical arguments to believe that these algorithms are actually better. And the other is that, you know, this is um, data that's from one firm at a particular point in time. And so if we want to think about how broadly these generalize, we need to sort of run more experiments in different kinds of data sets and different kinds of firms. And so I'm going to return to my shameless plug, which is that we should, um, if anyone uh, has any leads on this, I would love, I would uh, love to pursue it. Um, and yeah, so this is sort of the end of my main talk. I have some additional results I can show you regarding kind of like race blinding of the algorithms and other things and so forth. But I think maybe we should just open it up for questions and we can talk. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Professor Lee. Amazing presentation. And uh, there was a question in the chat. Will we be able to share the slides uh, after our call? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I'll kick us off with a, uh, two questions that were uh, submitted via registration. And then if people would like to raise their hand, um, I can call and you can unmute and ask your question live. So I'll start with this one. Uh, what should candidates do to ensure they make the cut? How can companies ensure a broad range of candidates while still limiting those numbers? So how can candidates ensure that they make the cut? I think that that's, I think that's sort of like a broader question about how, um, how sort of behavior evolves. Cause there's a lot of, there's like a lot of software out there that's like, you know, you should screen your resume, make sure you sort of say these words and then th that those are the things that you, um, you can, you can do to sort of improve algorithms. I think that without knowing, like different companies use different algorithms and different algorithms weigh different things. So I think that it's actually kind of hard to sort of figure out, unless you know what's in those algorithms to sort of game uh, what you write on your resume. Um, I think that that's probably a good thing. Um, in a world where you can perfectly predict what's gonna get you um, into the interview, people start lying. Um, or they start manipulating things, and then it becomes less informative. Uh, and so I think one of the things that's important in algorithm design going forward is uh, trying to create algorithms that give people the incentives to tell the truth, as opposed to incentives to sort of say whatever it is that you think they, they wanna hear. 
Um, and then in terms of how companies, uh, how companies uh, sort of expand, kind of like make sure they have a good pool. I mean, algorithms are one thing, right? So you like that's one thing you can potentially do. Um, that's not a substitute for outreach, um, for getting people to apply in the first place, um, and also not a substitute for you know uh, development once people are once people are on the job. Such good points. Um, so I have one other pre-submitted question in uh, building the algorithm. How much time and effort does it take to create this approach uh, that's targeted for a specific company or role? Two part answer to that. So imagine you have the data already. Then it's super easy, actually. So you just hire like an undergrad from MIT with some computer science skills. There are algorithms that are pre-baked on um, on you know on Google in Python. I can give you the code for this. Uh, the thing that actually becomes much more challenging uh, is collecting the data. There's a lot. I mean, if what you have to have is you need to sort of be systematic in keeping track of data on your applicants, including the ones that didn't end up joining the firm. Um, and so. Um, the main kind of barrier, well, the main barrier is organizational will. Separate from that, uh, being able to sort of uh, have a systematic way of collecting data and updating data um, is, is sort of the primary barrier. Thank you. Um, we do have a question in the chat, but hearing voices other than mine. Yu Ting, are you able to unmute and ask your question live? Uh, sure. Uh, okay, so so I, I'm actually wondering, um, have you considered, because I think, again, I, sorry, I was actually 15 minutes late, so I'm not sure if you covered that in the beginning, uh, but it seems to me that the approaches I have compared, I think, with the four approaches is either assuming it's human-driven or it's a machine learning-driven. Have mm -hmm. you actually thought of a human in the loop uh, in your design? Uh, the reason I'm asking this is because while we have, I actually have worked on this uh, machine learning, uh, deep learning area for the last 10 years, what, I've, what we have found is that with all the limitations that we are seeing today, that properly de designed the algorithm where human in the loop can actually drastically improve the performance of, again, it depends on the, the problems that we're trying to solve, but in general, we kind of seeing the benefit of that. And so I'm just wondering if you have you thought about that. Yeah, absolutely. So not in this paper. Um, I think, so when we say human in the loop, there's actually lots of different ways to incorporate a human in the loop. One of the things that I've studied um, in the past is uh, there was this company that implemented sort of this job testing software and the job testing software kind of gave a score and they allowed um, their recruiters to sort of see the score and it became kind of, uh, you can use both pieces of information. So in some sense, like the ideal decision-making is the way is a way to find it because human people, like humans have insights and algorithms have insights. And so if we can kind of combine them efficiently, then we can obviously do better. Um, then the question becomes when you give um, humans, so in this case, what happens, you gave the, um, this company gave the recruiters full discretion as to whether or not to follow the score. And so what we show in that paper is essentially is that humans ignore the score a lot. So they make a lot of exceptions. They hire a bunch of people that the algorithm says they shouldn't hire. And one possibility is that they're doing that because I interviewed them. And I learned that that person's super motivated. I used my insight to make a better decision. Uh, what we showed in that setting, which is not to say that would be true in all settings, is that every time they made an exception, they did worse. So it, uh, the amount um, of kind of uh, uh, sort of self incorrect self-confidence was so high that it ended up probably being better to just like ignore the human altogether. So I think there's a lot of potential to um, like sort of statistically, there's a lot of potential to sort of improve decision making with human in the loop. But um, you have to sort of make sure that people are able to um, understand when to defer um, versus when to overrule. And that's something that I think oftentimes is challenging for people. Got it. Yeah, thank you. And, and, and if I may, just a, a, another question uh, that um, have you also thought of, okay, it seems that the model is more, be looking, more or less looking at this at the firm's level. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So, so now how do we think about, or how do you think about this from a more organization or from a specific category of jobs perspective? Um, because a lot of times we know, or mathematically, when we seek for global optimization, we might actually sacrifice uh, uh, so kind of more locally, right? And how do you actually think about this local optimal versus global optimal? Yeah, so I think, so in the, in the data, the way, way we've sort of structured it is that we created separate models for every kind of job in the firm. And so the data come from the firm, but everything's sort of like optimized locally. Uh, I mean, in general, there's sort of like a trade-off because uh, 
and I think I think maybe another way of answering this question is like you can imagine the company. There's a, you can use my own data to build the model. If I use my own data, I have sort of the the variables that are very specific and relevant for my setting, but I don't have that much data, so my predictions might not be as accurate. You can imagine all of the companies, so that all the consulting firms, for instance, pooling their data and sort of taking estimates across that entire data set, um, in which case you might be um, looking at jobs that might not be exactly the same as what I'm doing, um, but you have sort of larger data sets. My general sense is that there are really high returns to pooling data um, to learn more, but that companies and organizations are not willing to share their data. Uh, and I think that that creates um, barriers for learning. Okay, got it. Yeah, thank you. We have a, a couple of other pre-submitted questions um, here. So uh, could the same principles you discussed for hiring be used for any selection process such as student admissions? I think so, yeah. So I think, I mean, it's a, there's a lot of problems that we treat as kind of prediction problems instead of learning problems. So student admissions could be one of them. Um, how to... Um, do medical treatments, for instance, uh, you know, which drugs we should try a patient on to begin with. Uh, and I, I think, yeah, I think one of the reasons I wrote this paper was not just about hiring in general, but that uh, there are a lot of applications of machine learning when people talk about machine learning as being really good for prediction, uh, when I think the correct way to think about it is as a learning problem. Um, and it's sort of important to make that distinction because we use different classes of algorithms depending on the nature of how we define the problem. But I think for, for student admissions, absolutely. Makes good sense. So, and there's a question in the chat and it actually was also pre-submitted a very similar question. So I'll combine the two. Have you incorporated behavioral assessments and, cog and cognitive assessments as additional data points in the model? For example, predictive index. I would love that to do that. I don't have the data in the setting. So remember, I just had the CV information for the predictive stuff. You'd have to sort of have people sort of take surveys or do some tests to get that additional information. Um, but there are um, there are companies that um, I'm sure you're probably aware of this that do incorporate kind of um, neuroscience and sort of psychology based components. Uh, so there's a company, for instance, called Pymetrics, which I think is um, founded. One of the founders is MIT um, is an MIT Sloan alum, and what they do is they actually have um, they have people play. I played these games. Uh, they have people sort of play uh, games to sort of measure your risk aversion or measure how well you multitask, um, and then use those um, components to help score people. And a nice thing about sort of that approach is that there are so there's like a lot of studies sort of showing that you know whether you're a computer science major that's very correlated with things like gender, but whether um, you know you play games in a particular way it sort of picks out a different set of variables that don't have the same kinds of correlations and can allow you to sort of make predictions that don't have the same kind of historical biases, which I think is nice. Yes. And I have one final question uh, as we wrap up our session here. So uh, one outcome you mentioned to predict success is performance rating, unless uh, hiring internally. So how do you effectively assess that? Yeah, I think one of these things is that it's Ultimately, and one of, the, one of the challenges of kind of algorithms is that at the end of the day, you have to call something the Y variable. And, you know, you can use a performance rating. A performance rating could be deeply, deeply biased. And there's a lot of research kind of showing that it is. Um, and so I think, I don't have a great answer to this. I think just the, the thing I would say is it's, it's very tempting to say that we can have an algorithm and it will like solve biases, um, but algorithms need to kind of have inputs and those inputs themselves matter. Uh, and so being able to kind of come up with robust ways to try to measure how well people really do, uh, that's, that's not sort of fully at the discretion of managers and subject to those kinds of biases is, is ultimately really important, even if you have really good algorithms. Indeed. So thank you so much, Professor Lee. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you, VJ, for kicking us off today. It's so great to be together. And during the campaign, we shared at MIT Sloan, a better world is our business. And our faculty are just such a shining example of that. So thank you again, Professor Lee. Thank um, you so much. Thank you for joining us. And we will share your information because I know you uh, made a couple of plugs today for people to be in touch with you. So we'll make sure that folks on the call have access to that. We'll share the slides and the video uh, for, for those on the call and also for those who couldn't join us today. 
I thank you all for joining us for this event and for all of your support over the, especially the last year. It's meant so much to me and I'm so proud to be a member of this community. Until we can be together again in person, I hope that you stay safe and stay well. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.